charging will be Actually, I, I, I think this can be built after. You can minimize it. Do that, okay. Okay. Yeah. So the um, recording will be equal, so there will be zero. Full zero. Yeah. Each thing will represent zero. Okay, sure. It will be added zero. Sure. Cool. Hello everybody, good evening and welcome to SOAS. It's very nice to see many familiar faces, friends, and, and new ones, and, and some of our students. My name is Mariano Erichiello. I'm the Shapurji Pallungi lecturer in Zoroastrianism at SOAS, and the executive director of the Shapurji Pallungi Institute of Zoroastrian Studies, which I chair together with my colleague, Almut Hintze, the Artoshti Brothers Professor of Zoroastrianism here at SOAS. Um, let me extend, first of all, my gratitude to our professional services team that uh, made this event possible. So we are actually streaming these uh, on, I think, Facebook and Zoom. Um, we got more than 100 registrations, expectations. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you to the student ambassador, and thank you to Imogen Edwards, who is the uh, executive officer of the Institute for taking care of every aspect of the organization of, of this event. The Pallungi Shapurji Mystery Memorial Lecture was established in 2023. Our first speaker was Justice Rohinto Nariman, and um, he spoke about the Sasanian dynasty that ruled Persia over 400 years. Uh, then, uh, last year, we had the honor to have here Dr. Leila Vevaina, who uh, discussed about the Parsi philanthropic activities and how they shaped the society of Parsis in Bombay and Hong Kong. And it is my great privilege to welcome today Daniel Sheffield, who is Associate Professor of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. Uh, Dan teaches history of medieval and early modern Iran and South Asia. Uh, he works on uh, Zoroastrian texts, I think composed in New Persian and Gujarati, but also works on Avestan and Pahlavi. So I think he's one of the very few scholars who can really work on a number of sources of different time and spaces. So that's amazing. Uh, and I know that you are also training your students on that. So um, Dan is um, uh, his monograph, Cosmopolitan Zarathustras, translations, um, translating Zoroastrianism in Iran and India, will be published next year. And he's currently doing research on the Davestani Mazaif, which is a 17th century encyclopedia of religions uh, in India. And today, Dan will present something very exciting and fascinating something new. So he will present about the stylistic typology of Zoroastrian miniature painting, the relationship between patrons, scribes, and artists, and the role that manuscript art played among Parsis in modern Bombay. Thank you for being with us, Dan, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. There's an old Calypso tune that says uh, London is the place to be, and it's a real honor to be here among so many old friends, uh, you know, uh, people who have been with me uh, over the last 20 years of my sort of journey within Zoroastrian studies. It's really an honor uh, to be here. Uh, so thank you, Mariano, thank you, Almut, uh, and thank you to all of you who have, uh, as you'll see, uh, and many of you have contributed in various ways to this talk, uh, but thank you all for your, your interest. It's a real honor to be able to deliver a lecture like this to you all. The modern field of Zoroastrian studies has been active for more than 300 years, right, since Thomas Hyde in 1700. Um, and in spite of this, there are probably still more Zoroastrian texts which remain in manuscripts around the world than have ever been published, let alone studied or translated by modern scholars. I spent the better part of the last 15 years studying the life of this manuscript tradition and especially those priests and scholars uh, who were active during the centuries in which these man the manuscripts that have come down to us were copied. 
It's taken me to familiar places here in the UK, to the British Library. I'm very honored to have Ursula Sims Williams here and the Bodleian, uh, where I'm currently working as a Bahari fellow, uh, to Paris, Copenhagen, and Munich, to places where I formed lifelong friendships and deep attachments, Bombay and Navsari in India, and to unexpected places where I never expected to find Zoroastrian manuscripts, places like Hyderabad in South India, and even right under my nose at the Princeton University Library uh, in New Jersey. I had no idea we had Zoroastrian manuscripts until I, you know, <laughs> a few years ago when a, when a student came to me and said that she had found two things. You can read about sort of my journey through Zoroastrian manuscripts in my book, which is coming out next year, Cosmopolitan Zarathustras, which Mariano very kindly introduced. But today I want to talk about something I don't often get an opportunity to discuss, something that I think a lot of us in the field recognize sort of intuitively uh, and maybe even you know, sort of have deep attachments to. Um, that is the beauty of Zoroastrian manuscripts. Um, when I first started in the field of Zoroastrian studies some 20 years ago, I came to the field from archaeology. As such, I've always been drawn to the materiality of the tradition. Back then, in you know, the early 2000s, uh, when I was just uh, beginning in Zoroastrian studies, my teacher, Johan Vavina, is here. Uh, there was very little, though, that was written about the history of, you know, the, uh, of Zoroastrian art. Um, and the revolution that we've been witnessing for the last 20 years in manuscript studies pioneered by scholars like Almut Hinza and my colleague Alberto Contera in Berlin was really just in its infancy. Um, and so today what I want to do uh, is to talk um, about um, the art of the book uh, within the Zoroastrian tradition. So let's see if I can get the PowerPoint working here. I began with some sort of basic questions. Right? What is Zoroastrian book art? Well, we can answer this question in many different ways. Right? We could talk about different kinds of art uh, that have come down to us uh, in the hundreds of uh, manuscripts uh, that we today have access to around the world. Just so everyone's on the same page, when I talk about manuscripts in today's talk, I'm talking about uh, books that are written by hand, very often copies of, of older manuscripts uh, that have uh, been preserved uh, primarily uh, by uh, Zoroastrian priests uh, in both Iran and in India, which today survive in libraries all around the world, in Zoroastrian religious libraries in India uh, and in Iran, in national libraries, such as those we have here uh, in the UK, uh, in private libraries and in private collections. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit at the end of today's lecture about printed books. But for the most part, I'm going to be talking about Zoroastrian book art as it pertains specifically uh, to Zoroastrian manuscripts. Okay, so what is Zoroastrian book art? We talk about various you know, different artistic elements um, uh, that make up uh, this sort of broad aesthetic category of, of book art. We can talk, for instance, about decorative art. Sure, many of you who have grown accustomed to going to lectures in Zoroastrian studies have seen you know, probably endless pictures of Zoroastrian manuscripts in Avestan or in Middle Persian, but something we seldom you know, uh, sort of stop to even look at uh, is uh, the cover of the book. That is, you know, the, the moment before we even open uh, a manuscript, um, uh, simply to look at the way in which uh, the manuscript is bound very frequently. Uh, Zoroastrian manuscripts, like other manuscripts from the Persian-speaking world, from the broader Islamic and Indic worlds in which Zoroastrians found themselves, uh, are bound uh, in uh, beautiful um, and highly ornate bindings. Here uh, is a manuscript I'll be talking a little bit about uh, later in today's lecture, uh, a manuscript kept in Manchester, John Ryland's Library, 1941, manuscript that was written in Navsari in Western India in 1789, uh, bound in a very sort of typical uh, stamped uh, Morocco leather, a red leather, you know, with a fine grain uh, that has been embossed um, uh, and uh, sort of tooled in a decorative way uh, and uh, further has um, some uh, gold paint which is applied to it. We talk about other forms of decorative art uh, within Zoroastrian manuscripts. Zoroastrian manuscripts very frequently, you know, um, again, like other manuscripts of the Persian world, have 
beautiful um, sort of frontispieces, decorative uh, titles and so on. Uh, put the Persian word for this is onvan. Uh, here uh, is one of countless examples of a finely decorated uh, Zoroastrian uh, onvan. The manuscript is in Persian. Uh, this is uh, from a manuscript in the National Library, of, uh, the National Museum of India in Delhi, uh, in which you can see very ornate vegetal motifs uh, and um, the application of uh, gold leaf paint. Um, my colleague uh, Salome Golami is here. Salome found uh, in uh, Iran, uh, brought to light a, a, a very large and important collection of Avestan manuscripts, several of which had beautiful uh, illumination. Uh, pictured here is a Safavid era uh, Vandidad Sade, again with a kind of ornate um, uh, sort of chapter introduction uh, in which uh, you can see pictured uh, two birds uh, mirrored uh, symmetrically in the middle uh, and flanked on either side uh, by, by two deer, right? these sort of wonderful animal motifs. This is a, you know, a Zoroastrian religious text, a ritual text, um, uh, something which has nothing to do really uh, with uh, birds and with deer, and yet, uh, you know, these uh, uh, beautiful decorative motifs have been applied uh, because these manuscripts are held uh, to be uh, valuable, right, to be important, to be things which people have um, real material connections with. So one kind of art when we discuss, you know, the art of the Zoroastrian book then is the decorative. And also talk about other kinds of artistic representation within Zoroastrian manuscripts, other kind of, you know, very commonly met with. Um, visual representation is a diagram or a technical drawing. What do I mean when I talk about diagrams or technical drawings? I mean things like this, uh, you know, for instance, uh, a map of the cosmos, right, um, uh, depicting uh, the uh, concentric circles which represent uh, the Zoroastrian and indeed in a, a much broader sort of Persian understanding uh, in the pre-modern world of the place of the earth uh, in the cosmos, right? Uh, and you can see sort of represented as concentric circles, uh, the, the different spheres uh, in this Ptolemaic model, uh, which make up um, the way in which the earth is understood uh, to relate to the sun, the moon, uh, and the planets. That's of course there at the bottom. You also see up at the top, uh, another kind of diagram, right? A, a kind of diagram that's still used in certain circles in India and in Iran, certainly in the West too. Uh, this is a horoscope, right, in which uh, you can see, you know, pictured in the different houses of the horoscope, uh, the positions of the planets and the ascendant stars um, uh, at the time in which an uh, individual uh, was born. Another very commonly met with kind of diagram that you can find in many Zoroastrian manuscripts is a diagram of you know, different kinds of Zoroastrian religious structures. We have um, several extant copies of uh, what a Tower of Silence, or a Zoroastrian, you know, to use the term loosely, burial place, uh, a dachma, uh, is meant to look like and how it is meant to be consecrated. Um, here, again, uh, a diagram of the dachma with some instructions uh, pertaining to its consecration in Gujarati uh, on this you know, sort of double uh, page uh, sort of uh, layout uh, in which the, the pegs and the string that are tied during the consecration of the dachma are, are all numbered uh, in Gujarati around, uh, around the central figure. Uh, another you know, commonly met with um, uh, diagram that one finds within the manuscript tradition uh, is a diagram of the ritual space, right? Pictured here is a sort of an unusual colored um, uh, and painted diagram of the Zoroastrian ritual space from the Merijirana Library manuscript E1, which is different than the E1 manuscript that Almut uh, published. It's very confusing because they're both no, sorry, manuscripts and they both have the same siglum, but they're different. And at any rate, this is an 18th century uh, manuscript, uh, which depicts the space in which the daily Zoroastrian sacrifice, the yasna ceremony, um, is performed. Uh, and the astute among you will no doubt note that uh, this diagram is uh, given in two different languages, right? So it's a, it's a pretty, you know, technical uh, diagram in that it would expect anyone who was, you know, to make use of it uh, to know both Avestan uh, as well as Gujarati. 
So it's you know a diagram that's obviously made uh, for learned persons, uh, for Zoroastrian priests. Okay, so we can talk about diagrams. We can talk about you know technical drawings as another kind of uh, venue uh, in which uh, artistic output um, was produced by Zoroastrians. That's not what I'm going to be talking about for the remainder of today's lecture, though. I'm going to be talking about narrative art. Right? What do I mean when I say narrative art? I mean pictures that accompany stories, pictures that you know help to visually illustrate a story that is, is being told uh, within uh, the manuscript. Um, we don't have uh, terribly many uh, examples of different Zoroastrian texts um, that have uh, accompanying narrative art. In a minute, we'll see, uh, however, that there is one Zoroastrian text for which we have quite a lot of narrative art. But before I start talking about that, I'll just give a couple of uh, examples of other works of uh, Zoroastrian narrative art. Um, my first example here is the story of Zarathustra, uh, which was uh, um, uh, widely uh, known and copied through its uh, sort of New Persian narration. Uh, the, the New Persian life of Zarathustra is conventionally known as the Zartoshnome or the Zarathoshnome, uh, a text which pre-modern authors describe as existing in literally every Zoroastrian household. Uh, we probably have somewhere around 100 extant manuscripts of this text, hugely popular. Uh, but there's only one manuscript I've ever seen that has uh, accompanying uh, narrative illustrations, accompanying, we'll call them miniature paintings, right? Um, that is a manuscript kept in the KR, comma, Oriental Institute, which had been acquired um, in Iran uh, by uh, the uh, um, Zoroastrian emissary from India to Iran in the mid-19th century, Manakji Limji Hataria. It's kept in Hataria's collection at the Kama Institute. Um, and as you can see, it's in very, a very poor state of preservation. Right? So this is a, uh, a miniature painting uh, depicting uh, the young Zarathustra, uh, pictured uh, in the middle, uh, who has just been thrown on a, uh, on a huge uh, flame uh, by an evil king and who miraculously uh, survives um, this fire. So this is a 17th century copy, um, uh, which was probably copied in Yazd, although the colophon uh, does not tell us exactly where it's from. So one narrative uh, illustration uh, group uh, belongs to uh, the story of Zarathustra in a single manuscript. Uh, recently, I discovered uh, that there is another Zoroastrian Persian narrative text, which also has miniature illustrations. I hadn't noticed this before, but recently the National Museum of India put some photographs of their manuscripts on, a, on a, a government website. The National Museum was recently renovated, as I think some people here know. Um, uh, this is a, a relatively little known uh, Zoroastrian New Persian text. It's the story of Sultan Mahmud of Ghazna, um, uh, which uh, was composed in the 16th century by a poet called Nushirvan and Mazuban. Um, and apparently there is an illustrated manuscript of this text um, in the National Museum uh, in Delhi. Uh, pictured here, uh, you can see in the center uh, a, a representation of Sultan Mahmud, the, uh, the, the Muslim Sultan who, you know, in large part uh, is responsible for establishing an empire that spanned uh, Afghanistan and Northern India. Uh, around him are two poets, Presumably one of them is Ferdosi. Um, and the, the Zoroastrian story of Sultan Mahmud tells us uh, that uh, the other poets being jealous of Ferdosi's stories of ancient Iran uh, began to intimate to the Sultan that he should uh, look into this sort of Zoroastrian business uh, and try to uh, bring the Zoroastrians within his empire uh, into the fold of Islam. The story then goes on to tell us how Zoroastrian priests responded to Sultan Mahmud's inquiries uh, regarding their religion, and ultimately they're winning him over uh, to allow them uh, to uh, thrive uh, within his empire. Okay, so a second narrative text uh, which has illustrations. But by far the, the most widely attested illustrated Zoroastrian text is not the Zaratoshnama, certainly not the story of Sultan Mahmud, uh, but rather a third text, um, which we can read about uh, in various um, uh, contemporary uh, 
sources, historical sources, uh, which, which, which discuss the text. Um, as I think many people here know, uh, we have uh, a body of uh, sources uh, which um, uh, uh, consist of letters um, of Iranian priests writing back to um, uh, questions that were posed to them by their Indian counterparts, uh, known as Revoyat literature. Uh, we have a, a sort of a, a string of many different Revoyats that began in the 15th century and continue to the late 18th, early 19th century, really. My student, Jamie O'Connell, uh, is, is currently working on this literature uh, and is uh, soon to defend a, a really amazing dissertation. Uh, but we read in this literature sometimes about books, right? What books do the Zoroastrian communities of India and Iran have? And sometimes we read about them exchanging books with one another. And here we read already uh, in the uh, 16th century uh, a mention of a book of Virof, a Virof nome with pictures. Right. The story of Ardaviroth, or Ardaviroz, as he's known in Middle Persian, uh, we'll come to in just a minute, um, but uh, it's, it's this text, uh, the story of Ardaviroz, or Ardaviroth, um, with which we'll be, uh, uh, which, which we'll be looking at for the right remainder of uh, the lecture today. Uh, we know also from European sources um, that uh, Zoroastrians in, uh, in Iran uh, were already um, in the 17th century, or still in the 17th century, uh, reading or looking at illustrated copies of, uh, the, of Punishments of Hell. That is uh, no doubt the same uh, book, the book of Azavidov. Right here, Jean Baptiste Tavernier, for instance, tells us. Uh, um, that the, their priests, meaning the Zoroastrian priests, have books filled with what he says are poorly executed miniature illustrations which represent how sins are punished in hell. Okay, so we'll see a few of those so-called poorly executed uh, miniatures uh, in just a moment. And we know that Zoroastrians continue to look at illustrated manuscripts or illustrated books of this story, the story of Ardaviroth, all the way down into the 19th, probably even early uh, 20th century. Uh, an early Parsi convert to Christianity uh, in writing his, you know, sort of journey from Zoroastrianism to Christianity uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, for instance, uh, recalls in his childhood seeing a Parsi lady sitting, reading a book uh, that was filled with pictures uh, depicting the joy of heaven and the torments of hell. And this uh, convert by the name of Danjibai Nauroji, pictured at the right here, uh, goes on uh, to uh, have kind of a a uh, moral crisis at having seen those pictures, right? He's just consumed with this sort of uh, idea of, of the punishment of the wicked in hell, um, which is one of the things that ultimately leads him in his narrative uh, uh, away from Zoroastrianism. Now, the story uh, of the Zoroastrian priest um, uh, by the name of Ardaviroz, uh, who receives visions of heaven and hell, um, is a well-known one uh, to scholars of Zoroastrianism. Uh, it's a story that is attested in Middle Persian, right? Pahlavi, uh, uh, you know, comes down to us presumably uh, in a recension of the ninth century um, uh, in Middle Persian. Uh, presumably it has origins um, that predate um, that, that point. Um, but we know, in fact, that in addition to the Middle Persian version of the story, there also circulated other versions of the story which um, changed the way in which the text was framed. Um, we have another uh, recension of the story in a language called Pazand, which also has a Sanskrit translation, which changes the frame of the Middle Persian story. There was recently published a second Middle Persian text called the Wira Zagan, which tells the story of Ardaviraz from a slightly different perspective uh, in Middle Persian. But not only do we have these sort of Middle Persian and Pazand and Sanskrit versions of the text, but there also exist numerous Persian translations, numerous new Persian Farsi translations of the text, as well as numerous Gujarati translations of the text. And it's those rather than the older Middle Persian versions of the text um, that we're going to be looking at. For the, anyone who's interested in the actual text of the Persian or the Gujarati, Adavirothname, Adavirothnamu, I can refer you uh, to the 2018 uh, University of Tehran thesis of Mir Salah Razavi, who's edited uh, in a wonderful edition, the, the Ardaviroth Nome uh, of Zartosh de Bahram of Hajdu. 
is the most common new Persian versified version of the story of Adivirov. Uh, and for those who are interested in the Gujarati text, I can refer you to the 1979 University of Gujarat thesis uh, by Perrin Driver, uh, who has edited uh, the medieval or the early modern Gujarati text uh, of the story. Now, when I first got into the field of Zoroastrian studies, uh, again, 20 years ago, I knew that there were some illustrated manuscripts of the Abdavidov Nome. I knew that you know, there had been, for instance, it's an exhibition in Berlin um, um, uh, in which a manuscript had been brought from the Kama, the K.R. Kama Institute in Bombay uh, of uh, the Abdavidov Nome. And I knew, you know, in, uh, sort of as I was sort of developed as a scholar interested in New Persian, more and more people uh, started to write to me about um, illustrated Abdavidov nomes that, that, that they had found. My colleague Ursula Sims Williams, for instance, uh, wrote a wonderful article on the collection of Samuel Guise, um, in which uh, a, a Persian manuscript of Abdavidov nome with illustrations uh, um, was included. A colleague in India in Baroda wrote to me about a manuscript uh, that she had found uh, in the, the library of uh, the Museum of Fine Arts there. And slowly I sort of got to thinking that um, someone should really do a proper survey of how many um, surviving manuscripts of this text that there are. Now, I, uh, in preparing this lecture, was myself astonished at just how many uh, texts I have now sort of been able to sort of track down of this text. Um, the oldest manuscript of the uh, Ardavidov nome uh, is one of the Persian Ardavidov nome, uh, and su surprisingly, uh, even to me, it's actually in the library of the university where I work. Um, and I swear to God, I had nothing to do with this, uh, nor did uh, they hire me because this manuscript was there. Um, um, uh, the manuscript was bought by Princeton in the 60s and promptly forgotten. Uh, it was never cataloged uh, and uh, was kept with uh, a group of Indian manuscripts um, in Sanskrit and other languages. Uh, it was never put with uh, uh, the sort of Islamic stuff. Uh, and so it was only thanks to the good graces of a, of a library saying, oh, you work on Zoroastrianism. I think we have some Zoroastrian stuff here. And who promptly pulled this thing out in an Avesta manuscript, uh, two uh, Zoroastrian manuscripts at Princeton. Anyway. Um, this is the manuscript which we have a date for, uh, 958 of the Yazdegerdi era, which is 1589 of the Common Era, no name scribe. Next oldest, from K.R. Kama Oriental Institute. I only have a few photographs of this manuscript that were published um, in other publications from 1628. Right? So you know, not too long after the Princeton manuscript, just some 40 years after the Princeton manuscript, um, uh, which is a wonderful, you know, uh, uh, manuscript um, with some very sort of finely detailed, you know, sort of Safavid imitation, Mughal style miniatures, as you can see here. Um, there is an Adavirov Name contained in the same manuscript that also has the Zautosh Name and the Ker Kama from 1635. That's our third manuscript. Going through these rather quickly because you'll see in a minute just how many of them there are. Uh, there is a manuscript of ad Duvidov Nome, a Persian manuscript uh, in the National Museum of India in Delhi uh, from the 18th century, uh, completed by a Sanjana priest uh, in the city of Surat. Strangely, it seems like uh, many of the copyists of illustrated Sartosh, uh, of ad Duvidov Nome manuscripts uh, were from the same family. Uh, they were all members of the Sanjana family uh, in India. Our fifth oldest manuscript is uh, the one that my colleague Ursula Sims Williams sent to me here in the UK in Manchester, um, previously owned by Samuel Guys, uh, copied in 1789, sort of you know moving uh, now into uh, the um, uh, colonial period. Um, and finally, a very interesting manuscript to me, though it's not technically an Ardavirov nome manuscript, uh, a um, an excerpt from the text called Dabistan and Mazal Heb, copied for the Nizam apparently in Hyderabad uh, in the 19th century in 1867. Um, the only portion of Dabistan and Mazal Heb that was copied uh, apparently is the story of Ardavirov. And uh, surprise, surprise, it has these sort of wonderful illustrations uh, of paradise. So these are our Persian manuscripts of Ardavirov Nome. There are six. 
but we also have Gujarati uh, language manuscripts of the Arda Virat um, uh, which began in the 17th century. Uh, here is a manuscript, uh, for instance, of Jamshid Jamas of Asa, copied in Nevsari in 1658. Two manuscripts in the Bibliothèque Nationale in France uh, that were obtained by Anquetil Duperon um, sometime before 1761. Neither of them has a colophon, so they don't have dates, but we, we know that they must be, you know, at least prior to the mid 18th century. Here's the second one. Uh, there is a, f our fourth oldest manuscript that I know of is uh, held in a private collection in Bombay uh, by a man by the name of uh, Homi Khusrokhan, uh, whom some of us know. Uh, he's a sort of prominent uh, person uh, within the community. This one copied in 1801. A fifth copy uh, of the Gujarati Ardaviratnamu has shown up in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, in the United States, uh, where uh, it uh, belongs to the collection of James Malekian. Uh, this one copied in uh, 1802, um, uh, again by uh, a Sanjana priest. <coughs> you know, as you can see, it, it's uh, somewhat visually striking and different from the others that I've just shown. A sixth uh, at the Bayerische Schatzbibliothek uh, in Munich, written in 1808. And then, um, this is just from publications. I don't know what private collections these are in, but there are at least two others um, that have been published in various places uh, that are ni none of those previous six. Uh, here is one of them, uh, and here is a second one. Apologies for the poor images. Right. So that's at least 14 total illustrated manuscripts of the story of Ardha Viroz. That's actually quite a lot. right? And there's something you know, there that we can then begin to study these manuscripts. Um, together uh, that might tell us something about why it is, how it was uh, that uh, Zoroastrians um, began to illustrate their books. Um, and um, we might be able to say at least a few preliminary things uh, about the different kinds of styles uh, that they employed um, therein. So um, I know I've already uh, spoken for about half an hour and uh, I'll just, you know, I think very quickly uh, move through the narrative of the Ardavirothname so that we can talk about what I think is more interesting, that is um, the sort of mechanics uh, uh, through which uh, Zoroastrian book art uh, was produced. But first, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the narrative, I'll try to give you, you know, it in the briefest uh, terms possible. According to the Persian version of the story of Ardaviroth, um, during the reign of the first Sasanian king, Ardashir Pabagon, uh, there was a question as to whether the Zoroastrian religion, as it had survived in the early Sasanian period, was a true reflection of uh, what had existed in the time of Zarathustra. Right? Alexander the Great had uh, destroyed uh, the uh, Persian Empire, as, as, uh, as we all know. And the tradition says that Alexander also uh, destroyed um, the Zoroastrian books that had existed at the, that time. So the Persian Ardavirofname tells us that Ardashir tries to sort of reconstitute uh, the Zoroastrian religion and wants to sort of prove its veracity. So how does he do that? Well, he picks a priest by the name of Ardaviroth uh, to go to heaven and hell and to bring back an account of what he sees there uh, and to tell whether it's in accordance uh, with uh, what has been transmitted uh, to Ardashir. Now, all sounds great, but how do you send a priest uh, to heaven and hell? You don't just kill him, of course, because he wouldn't be able to come back and tell you. Uh, so what the text tells us is, and this is the Persian version of the text, uh, that, uh, um, that Ardashir uh, has this priest drink uh, a, a concoction of halma, of hom, this you know, Zoroastrian, um, uh, this plant that is central to the Zoroastrian ritual. Um, of course, in the earlier tradition, the identity, the, the text, the plant is called mung rather than halma, but in the Persian text, uh, we have, you know, it's sort of always normalized as halma. Anyway, the priest drinks it, uh, goes into a trance, a sleep-like trance, and then proceeds to have visions of heaven and hell. Right? So here he is in the Princeton manuscript being given the drink. Here he is being led across the Chinwad pool uh, to paradise, the bridge uh, which, which leads uh, the souls of the departed uh, to heaven, where their, soul, their good deeds and their bad deeds are weighed against each other. Um, 
once he is in heaven, he ascends through a series of, of, of levels to reach paradise, at which point he sees uh, sort of uh, numerous places in paradise where there are assembled groups of people who have uh, performed different kinds of good deeds. Uh, in this particular illustration, he's shown uh, with the souls of the warriors, or the souls of the heroes, Pahlavon. The Persian version of Abdul Rahman may give some 15 different scenes depicting different kinds of good deeds uh, that are performed. Then, after he's seen all the good stuff, uh, he's led back to the bridge uh, where he sees uh, instead uh, what happens to the sinners. Um, here, uh, he sees uh, for the first time the evil deeds of a person dragging that person off the bridge down to hell. Uh, that's what you can see there at the bottom, um, uh, where they are. Uh, he then proceeds to walk through hell looking at the different kinds of punishments that are meted out to the different groups of the sinners. Uh, pictured here, for instance, are those sinners uh, who did not tie their kasti, right, their, their, their ritual belt. Um, uh, pretty harsh punishment. Hopefully everyone ties their custody here because I uh, uh, wouldn't wish this on anyone uh, to be consumed by wild demonic beasts. Thus, the Persian Aldevirothname, in a nutshell, usually a Persian illustrated Aldevirothname manuscript has somewhere in the vicinity between 30 uh, and 40 um, uh, illustrated scenes altogether. Okay. So where do these sort of illustrations come from? Where does the style of illustrating um, uh, manuscripts come from? I think my Islamicist colleagues in the room uh, would uh, see much familiar, of course, uh, in, in the manuscripts of Abdul Rothname that I've just shown you. Um, there is you know, uh, a broader uh, trend across the Islamic world um, in which Zoroastrians found themselves uh, of depicting various uh, interpretations of heaven and hell. We have Muslim manuscripts, right, such as the one that I show here, uh, which, for instance, depict uh, the Prophet Muhammad's uh, uh, ascension uh, to paradise uh, and uh, his vision also of uh, the suffering of the damned in hell. Uh, here, uh, a, a manuscript, a Timurid era manuscript of the Miraj Nama, in which Prophet Muhammad at the right um, is witnessing the zakum tree in hell uh, and the punishment of sinners um, thereby. We find you know, these sort of traditions of depicting um, the reward of the righteous and the punishment of hell across um, you know, both the Iranian and the South Asian worlds. Um, there exist uh, numerous uh, Indic manuscripts, uh, particularly Jain manuscripts, uh, which uh, also uh, depict from a Jain perspective um, the punishments meted out in hell uh, to the souls of the wicked. Here you can see, for instance, a 19th century uh, manuscript um, like that. And with this Jain manuscript, I now want to turn very briefly to talk about the stylistic differences between the Persian um manuscripts that have come down to us and the Gujarati Adavirothname manuscripts which have come down. Um, pictured here uh, is uh, a, uh, a copy of the Ardavirov Namu uh, from Munich. And let's just think about you know, some of the visual differences first uh, that we can observe um, as the artist tries uh, to depict um, these scenes um, from perhaps a more Indic or from a more um, sort of Gujarati uh, perspective. Uh, one of the most striking visual differences, actually, uh, that I've observed uh, between the Gujarati and the Persian uh, versions of the story um, is that uh, in the Persian versions of the story, uh, figures are very often shown behind something, right? You have this kind of um, visual perspective of the three, uh, the three onlookers uh, standing behind a mountain, right? This place before them. You have this kind of uh, perspective, um, whereas uh, in all of the Gujarati manuscripts of the text, uh, the, the, uh, the witnesses are, are shown simply flat. There's nothing uh, that sort of uh, obstructs them at all. And this is one sort of uh, among many of the stylistic differences uh, that, that uh, can be observed uh, within um, some of these texts. The Gujarati Ardaviroth Namu cycle also uh, sort of beefs out the story of Ardaviroth uh, quite considerably. While the Persian version of the story starts uh, with the reign of Ardashir, uh, the Gujarati version of the story takes the story all the way back uh, to the time of Alexander the Great. 
um, pictured here um, uh, is the battle uh, between Alexander uh, and the Persian king Dara. I don't know which one is which in this image, um, um, but uh, the narrative thus starts by telling us uh, uh, um, uh, you know, why it is that Zoroastrian books have been destroyed by, by beginning the narrative here. Um, there are also many more illustrations uh, in a Gujarati Ardaviraf Namu manuscript than there are in Persian. Right? Most Gujarati Ardaviraf Namu manuscripts have somewhere closer to the you know, uh, 70 uh, or 80 illustrations. Right? Here um, uh, is a common depiction in the middle of many of these manuscripts uh, in which you have this fabulous you know, bifolium in which there are two facing pages, both of which are completely devoted uh, to image uh, depicting uh, the gardens uh, of paradise um, from uh, the 18th century manuscript in Paris. Gujarati Ardavirov Namu manuscripts also very frequently um, uh, near the middle of the text uh, give visual representations of ancient Iranian kings, right? not directly related to the story. You know, this, the, the, the text simply says that you know, ancient kings are um, there in paradise. Then the illustrator goes on to add pictures of each of, uh, uh, of a lineage of kings um, in a somewhat uh, um, random order. But here you can see uh, Kaus, Feridun, um, Jamshed, uh, Iraj, uh, and sort of continuing um, uh, all the way here to Goshtasp and uh, Jamoth from the time of Zarathustra. Um, so sort of a growing uh, uh, kind of historical consciousness, um, you know, that is present within the text. Uh, and then finally, uh, the narrative of Ardaviraf doesn't just sort of cut off at the end of Ardaviraf seeing hell, uh, but continues to give more closure to the story. So I think this is sort of cute that all the Gujarati manuscripts do. Ardaviraf, you know, has, you know, when, at the beginning of the story, ascends to paradise and stops at the station of the stars, the moon, and the sun on his way up. And in the Gujarati story, he also goes back down and everyone waves goodbye to him, right? So these are um, the different uh, people at the station of the sun uh, and the station of the moon waving goodbye uh, to Adiviroff and they actually see them waving. It's, it's like I said, it's kind of cute. <laughs> um, Moreover, what can we do with this kind of you know, visual representation? It's all well and good you know, to see these kinds of generic pictures of how um, uh, you know, righteous uh, persons and sinners are rewarded or punished uh, in, in heaven and hell. Um, but when one looks a little more closely at the manuscripts, uh, one can also find sort of little details, uh, signs uh, of um, the way in which Zoroastrians of the early modern world um, sort of imagined the world around them. Right? We can look for you know, certain themes that are common uh, in different manuscripts of the Adavirov Nama. Right? For instance, here, two scenes of an imagination of what fire temples look like. Right? You can see the sort of central um, fire altar, presence of the bell, uh, priests with ritual implements tending to the fire. Um, in the figure on the left, there is a well. Uh, probably there's a well also in the figure on the right. I think that's what's in the bottom left. Also in the figure on the right, you can see the Varasya, the, the sacred white bull of, of the Zoroastrian tradition. You can see how early modern Zoroastrians imagined the, their, their burial places, the, the dakma and the ritual that was involved uh, in taking the body uh, to the burial place here uh, from the story of the death of, of the king Dara, who's killed by Alexander. Dara's body is carried on the bier uh, to, uh, to its final resting place within the Dakma. And note that those two sort of illustrations of the Tower of Silence look a lot like the diagram of the Tower of Silence that we, we saw earlier. Uh, pictured here always is the dog, the, uh, whose uh, um, place within Zoroastrian death ritual uh, is, is well known. Um, but you can also see you know, certain technical aspects of, of the funeral ritual, which were contested in the early modern period, specifically whether or not the legs of the body should be straight or bent um, became a very heated question uh, within early modern Zoroastrian um, ritual correspondence and in all illustrations of the Adviraf Namu, the legs are always shown uh, to be bent. Um, so again, an interesting sort of reflection on you know, early modern 
ritual practice. But our questions don't have to just sort of revolve around you know, this kind of technical ritual stuff either, right? One can find other kinds of like imaginations of culture and the places or offerings within the world, uh, within um, early modern manuscripts as well. Just as one of many examples, um, there are um, numerous representations uh, of musicians uh, in the scenes of paradise uh, within uh, the Erda Rudolph family. Uh, pictured here, our Princeton manuscript on the left, our Munich manuscript on the right, uh, in which we have uh, a woman playing the harp uh, uh, and a dancer uh, being depicted in the left scene, while in the right scene, a man is playing some sort of, let's say, vina, some sort of you know, um, lute-type instrument, uh, and another man is shown pick playing a drum, um, while uh, an, an audience uh, enjoys sitting around a beautiful fountain. Here, one more uh, illustration of musicians, right? A woman, again, playing some sort of lute or sitar, perhaps, uh, and another, um, I think, with, um, you know, symbols or bells or something uh, in her hand. Right. Okay, so enough about the content of, of the, the manuscripts. Let's just talk very briefly about how, what we can see about the, the, the way in which these manuscripts were produced, and then I'll just wrap up. Um, how were they produced? Well, we have no idea because they don't tell us, you know, um, who the artists were or how the artists operate. Everything we have to, everything we can um, sort of glean uh, about the manuscripts production and particularly about the illustration process has to be um, uh, interpreted uh, directly from the evidence of the manuscripts themselves. One thing that becomes immediately clear um, has to do with the question of the order uh, of, of the production, right? Does one write the text and illustrate the text at the same time? Does one write the text in its entirety, leave you know, and then come back to it and illustrate it? Does one illustrate the text first? and then uh, later write the text? Well, it's quite clear um, from surviving manuscripts that the text is written first and illustrations are added after the text is written in its entirety. We have at least three manuscripts, uh, one in Navsari and two in uh, Bombay, uh, which are entirely, uh, which have left giant spaces for illustrations, but which are entirely unillustrated, right? So we know that they intent th there was an intent um, at some point to add uh, illustrations, um, but for whatever reason, that was never completed. Pictured here is one that I'm actually able to show an image of, uh, which is not from either Navsari or from Bombay, uh, but of another manuscript, uh, again, from Paris, uh, in which uh, th there are a few scenes which are left blank, but most of the manuscript has been filled in, right? So at the top, uh, it's supposed to have an image of Adavidov waking up, that was never put in, but at the bottom uh, it says um, uh, that uh, Ardashir then, uh, Ad Adavidov then goes to the court of Ardashir uh, who sends letters across Iran um, that the Zoroastrian religion is true and that uh, scene has been, has been put in. Okay, so we know illustrations come after text. I was really surprised when I found these in, in our Princeton manuscript. Can anyone maybe these look, is there anything striking about these images? Anything odd, um, given what, what you've seen of everything else? Anything that might be missing from these two pages? What was that? Heaven and hell, yeah, yeah but that's not odd. That's what we've seen everything, you know, everything's been of heaven and hell, right? There's no script, right? There's no text on these pages, right? And in fact, um, both of these pages are not bound in the manuscript. Right. They were merely, they, they were sort of uh, inserted uh, into the manuscript and they have nothing written either on, on, the, uh, on the recto side of the page, which you can see pictured, nor is there anything written on the verso side. In other words, they're basically loose leaf pa pages um, uh, which have illustrations on them. And in fact, these illustrations directly correspond to illustrations that are in the text, right? So here, the same manuscript, you can see the same scene Different style, obviously, uh, uh, in a, uh, on the right, um, um, which uh, is more or less copied uh, in the image on the left. Uh, and here, the other one of those in which you can see the same scene uh, uh, on the right and on the left. So what are these, you know, sort of loose leaf sheets that are inserted in our manuscript of, of illustrations? Of course, we don't know for certain what they are. Um, but uh, I think that there's strong reason to believe that these are templates, you know, that were either copied from this manuscript 
for the production of other manuscripts, uh, or perhaps used to make this manuscript from, a, from some sort of body uh, of template uh, illustrations that have just sort of been left here. And it turns out that the, the, the sort of program of scenes uh, that, that proceed throughout the Persian art of Iraq Nameh and the art of Iraq Namu in Gujarati are generally always the same. That is, you know, you can basically tell whether a manuscript is, in, is, is disordered or not uh, if the scenes come in the wrong order because they always come in the same sort of programmatic order. You, you have the heaven of the heroes before the heaven of the priests, uh, before the heaven of the farmers, before the heaven of the shepherds. And if that comes in any other order, it's likely that one of your folios has been uh, um, disordered. And you can check that by looking at the catch words at the bottom, which, which confirm um, the, the sort of order of the manuscript. OK, so we kind of know that, you know, uh, that uh, there's like a real programmatic way in which these manuscripts are being illustrated. And you know, perhaps they even are working from some sort of you know, template that, that might have been uh, circulated in a kind of uh, book production workshop. Um, can anyone see anything funny about this one? It might be a little too hard to see on the screen. Well, if I zoom in, you'll see it, so let's zoom in. Any, can you see it now? What do you see? It's on top of another one, right? Uh, you can actually see the pencil traces, right? You know, uh, which, which uh, were, it's a bit odd because, you know, like how translucent is their paint that you can see the pencil? Um, but uh, but there, there, there's a pencil sketch uh, which, which underlies many, uh, in fact, many extant images, and not just in the Paris manuscript. Um, uh, there's at least one case in which you can kind of see um, that, okay, here's, here's the one I want to talk about. Right? That pencil sketch has like horses and a chariot right in the back, and, and the, you have you know, two sort of figures in the foreground. And in fact, that's a different image. You know, that's this image. Uh, so maybe they started drawing the wrong uh, miniature and then realized they were wrong uh, and painted something else on top of it because it was the wrong order. Right? So you can actually kind of see the, like, the trace of the artist in these manuscripts. I think it's amazing uh, because even though we know so, so little about you know, how these manuscripts were produced, who actually painted them, um, uh, the closer we start to look at them and sort of get into you know, their world, the, the more these kind of like fascinating details about the actual process of you know, production of manuscripts for a relatively you know, uh, sort of middle class community during this period um, you know, actually came to take shape. All right, so that leaves me with my sort of closing lines. Right? So what can we say then about how illustrated Zoroastrian manuscripts were produced? We know that uh, illustrated Zoroastrian manuscripts uh, um, uh, were, um, like almost all Zoroastrian manuscripts, written uh, by priestly scribes. Right? Uh, almost everything that comes down to us uh, from uh, the medieval and early modern tradition um, contains colophons that tell us the name of the scribe, often the date um, uh, in which the manuscript was written, sometimes the place in which the manuscript was written, and almost always that scribe is a priest. Should we assume that it was this priest who also illustrated the manuscript? I don't think that we have enough evidence uh, to sort of say that positively. I think it, my own sort of feeling is uh, that the priest likely wrote the manuscript and then gave them uh, to um, an artist, perhaps who worked on commission, uh, to sort of fill in the gaps and to illustrate uh, what remained. But one interesting thing that we see, particularly in Gujarati manuscripts, is that Gujarati colophons very often tell us not just the name of the priest, uh, who copied the manuscript, but also the person who commissioned the manuscript, the patron of the manuscript. You don't see it too often in Persian manuscripts. Sometimes you do, uh, but it's very, very common in Gujarati to have both Laknar, the scribe, and the Kavnar, the, the, the person who orders the manuscript to be copied. And this one, uh, it just blew me away when I saw this image for the first time, uh, because this is the only time I've ever seen in the illustrated Zoroastrian manuscript tradition another kind of Zoroastrian art. Right? We've seen decorative art, we've seen diagrams and technical dra uh, drawings, we've seen narrative art, and here we see portraiture. Right? This is a portrait of a living person, a portrait of the, the patron of the manuscript, pictured there on the left, um, in which the scribe has very carefully noted 
This is Pastenji, Kuverji, Ranji. I didn't give his full information here, but they, in the colophon it says, Pastenji, Kuverji, Ranji, known as wine cellar. Right? He was Sharab Farosh, according to the text. And he was the one who had ordered this illustrated uh, Vizirasan. On the right, there's a figure um, who I sort of cheated here. I put the two fly leaves of the manuscript together. In the actual text, there's a whole block of text between them. But I deleted that whole block of text digitally and just put them facing each other because the images obviously mirror each other. You have no idea who this figure on the right is. But it's possible that it's the scribe, it's the priest, um, who's, of course, also uh, mentioned uh, in the uh, colophon of the text. His name is Minuchu uh, Jamas Bhaiji, uh, and he's shown there um, uh, facing his patron uh, in this sort of wonderful um, and, and sort of unique piece of portraiture uh, within Zoroastrian book art. Now, I'm kind of running out of time, so I have other things that I could say about uh, the relationship of this manuscript material uh, with the history of the Zoroastrian printed book. But I think I'm going to leave that aside for the Q&A. If anyone has any questions about that, I'll be happy to go into it. Uh, and instead, I, I'm really looking forward to a conversation with you all about this material. Thank you so much for paying attention to me. And, uh, uh, and thank you, Mariana, for all of this. Thank you so much for this wonderful journey into the art of Zoroastrian manuscripts. Uh, I didn't know that uh, Giraf Rame was that popular uh, among artists. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, so uh, if I would like to start with a question. What do you think, what does it tell us about the um, agency of 